A figure of much controversy is and has been Justice Brent Benjamin. I'll talk with Justice Benjamin right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you. Justice Brent Benjamin has attracted much attention in his seven years on the West Virginia Supreme Court. My guest is Justice Brent D. Benjamin. Justice Benjamin, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, actually, you have been with us here earlier this season. Yes. I'm glad, glad we had a chance to get back together. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about, it, and it's because it has kind of surfaced again in the news, people talking about it during the current election cycle, and when people who know of you hear your name, the first thing they think of is recusal, didn't do it, uh, went to the Supreme Court, all of that. Can you tell us a little bit about what the facts, what the situation was at the time Caperton versus Massey came to the Supreme Court and you had to decide whether you were going to step aside? Well, first of all, uh, most people, I think, uh, when when they hear my name, uh, think of drug courts and access to justice and getting the poor access to the civil justice system and the criminal justice system in West Virginia, and that's what we've been focusing on so much. But, but you know, it's another election cycle. I'm not even up for election, and yet they still won't leave me alone for some reason on, on the, uh, on the uh, recusal issue. Uh, simply stated, there, the, the, um, uh, there was a case that came up a couple years while after I was on the Supreme Court called Caperton versus Massey. Uh, my record was very clear on Massey, uh, notwithstanding uh, the election issues. Um, my voting record was about 80 percent against Massey. Uh, on this one case, it was an important case. It was not the biggest Massey case we had. And um, uh, based on the fact that um, my voting record and the fact that uh, there was no ascertainable reason under the existing law as it was at that time, I chose not to recuse myself without seeing more from uh, what the plaintiffs had uh, had in their motion. And uh, basically, Caperton, with Benjamin voting, Caperton lost. That went to the Supreme Court, came back, and Mr. Caperton got another shot, this time without Benjamin. So we had Benjamin or Caperton with Benjamin voting, Caperton lost. Caperton without Benjamin voting, Caperton also lost when he got a completely new panel. Only this time he lost by an even wider margin. So, um, so in the in the long run, it didn't nothing changed except the fact that the one time uh, in a major case that I ever voted in four years for Massey, it turned out the other judges after me said I voted the right way. The case itself, Massey versus Caperton, was a business dispute. Yes, it was between. Uh, coal companies in Virginia. The case had begun in Virginia that had actually gone to trial and there had actually been a six million dollar recovery. And then the matter started up again here in West Virginia. The argument was by the plaintiffs that it was a new case. The Supreme Court here decided that it was not and it needed to go back to Virginia. That was that was the the issue that was on the table in front of the court. Well, there were a lot of issues in the case, but that's the essence of what happened. It's now back in Virginia, and the reason you were singled out for attention was because the, of the perception of at least some of the public that Massey 
and particularly Don Blankenship, who was its chief executive officer, the CEO of Massey, was a big supporter of yours. Well, I think that I, I think it be, he was a big opponent to my to my opponent. Uh, I think it was a better way to put it. I'm not sure that uh, Mr. Blankenship thought that highly of me, at least from things that have been said in the public. But one thing we do know is he did not like Warren McGraw. Um, and he uh, spent a lot of money unelecting Justice yes, McGraw. Yes, uh, in what they call independent expenditure groups, which are something that uh, I've spoken publicly against. Um, now, most recently at William and Mary, uh, about the problems that we have with these large independent expenditure groups coming in, and how it makes elections difficult, particularly for those running, because we have a problem getting our message out, because it gets confused with the message of the independent expenditure groups. And well, you ran a campaign that basically said, "Vote for me." Well, it was. I tried to explain what I was about, how I wanted to turn around the court, how I thought the court had become too political inside. And I mean, we don't have to think back too hard to 2004 to remember just how political of a court the West Virginia Supreme Court was. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was an embarrassment, quite frankly, to me as an attorney that we had a court like that. Um, that, I think, was a perception that was widely held in the state. Uh, that combined with a speech which uh, Justice McGraw gave um, on Labor Day in southern West Virginia, um, that, those were the two things which I think most West Virginians understand and believe uh, were the deciding factors in the case, or in the, in the campaign. And, um, and, and uh, you know, we went on, and as I said, over four years in voting in Massey matters, there was I mean, if that's my earn run average, so to speak, or my batting average, it certainly uh, showed um, no, no favoritism whatsoever towards Massey. In fact, it was probably, uh, when you say 80% against Massey, when you take the Caperton case out, I think for every $1 Massey benefited from one of my votes, it was, it was hurt almost $100. That's pretty astonishing. So you weren't always on Massey's side? Uh, rarely. And in fact, on Blankenship, probably didn't care who you were, he was running against Justice McGraw. Uh, that's my best guess. He was certainly not there in the primary when I was running. Well, did the Supreme Court change the rules about recusal in, in any way? Well, Are we doing things differently? I, I, I think the important thing is to look at what, where have we come uh, from in, since 2005. 2005 to 2009 was the turning of the ship, so to speak. In 2009, we were, was, I think, the pivotal uh, point for this court. Uh, we were able to create uh, a team atmosphere with the five justices. We have five justices which are, quite frankly, very, the, the five of us are very unique, diverse people. We come from different backgrounds. We practice different types of law. But we all have one common thing, and that is to build the best Supreme Court we can. And so what you've seen happen, particularly in the last four years, uh, is Supreme Court justices coming out of Charleston, coming around to the various areas of the state, and doing things that I think are very helpful to the state, such as the work that Justice Davis is doing on truancy, uh, I, hopefully the work that I'm doing with drug courts and with accessing the justice system from those who can't afford attorneys called access to justice. And now that the judge, and, and this plus the, the fact that we've got judges throughout the state, circuit judges, family court judges, who are also giving of their time to go out and help people, I think is a high mark on the judicial system uh, in this state as we're coming up on, um, on a uh, very important anniversary next year. Um, which will be, what, our 150th um, anniversary. That would be right. So um, uh, I'm very proud of where our court has been able to come. And most importantly, I'm, I'm proud that we've been able to take those politics out of the court because I think most people, when they look at the court, they don't see Democrats, they don't see Republicans, they don't see factions down there, they don't see arguments going on, they certainly don't see justices coming out and making wild accusations against other justices simply because they didn't get their own way. We've got a court now that I think the people are very proud of and uh, they have a reason to be proud of. We're not done yet. Uh, we're just beginning, and I think that's a great thing for our state. Well, I, d I don't want to leave this recusal issue quite yet. Mm -hmm. 
Have there been any changes in the rules about how you decide whether you're going to step aside? And the reason I ask that is because our judges are popularly elected. You right. do have to run in campaigns. You have to try to make people like you. Mm -hmm. And you probably have to say things to them that they want to hear to a certain extent. Yet, virtually everybody that comes in front of you as a, a county judge or as a Supreme Court justice is somebody that you've had an opportunity to know. These are not strangers who come into your courtroom. But it's been that way for the whole 150 years of our state's history. And what we've seen is there's, nev there's never been any accusations. Uh, generally, these have come up only recently as we've seen these groups that want to do away with our ability to elect judges uh, making these types of allegations that somehow elections are corrupt per se. And that's just not true. You know, I, I for one don't think that we're ready to give up people electing judges. And what happens is these groups want to disenfranchise uh, the, elector, the, the, the voters. Uh, they want, for instance, uh, me to be able to look at another justice and say, you're not going to vote on this court, and I've got two other justices who are going to back me up on that, and then just completely take that judge right off the panel, and along with that judge, all the people who voted for that judge. That's disenfranchising a lot of people. I think it's very undemocratic. That's uh, if you had a majority of the justices deciding who sure. was going to be thrown off a case. Sure, and I think this whole thing about recusal is is all a a tempest in a teapot, it's, it's coming up with solutions where there really is no problem. In the Caperton case, for instance, which even if you look at that, there weren't three votes because the law as it was at the time I followed. Uh, exactly, they the court in a 5-4 decision at the, in Washington ch changed the rules uh, or changed the law and sent it back and, and, I, and I, I recused myself for the um, last time and of course Mr. Caperton lost again. But there wouldn't, I would, would have still have voted in that second case. There wasn't a three-judge panel, I don't think, there that would have voted me off, num number one. But number two, um, what panels do is they create political infighting in the court. They create factions in the court. It's an opportunity, you know, it's almost as if we're, we're going back to the worst of what television has become with these reality shows and say, let's vote off a justice this week. Who are we going to vote off this week? <laughs> and it creates factions within the court. Imagine for a moment in the Arbaugh case, which certainly was a very controversial case. What, what was that? The Arbaugh case was a case in 2004 in which a person who, uh, uh, an individual who had been convicted of multiple offenses or had been convicted of basically child rape. And the history showed that there had been multiple instances. Now this individual, while he was a teenager when he committed these, was given every opportunity to be a youthful offender and avoid hard time and failed at every opportunity and finally was given that hard time. The Supreme Court changed all that. They, 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 they overruled the local judge, uh, said no, he's not going to prison, and actually, according to the order, uh, referred him or suggested he be referred for rehabilitation to be a janitor in a middle, mid, or a, a middle level school in Wheeling, West Virginia. Now, if, three, if the three majority judges had voted Justice Davis off of that case, we would have never heard of any of the problems because she would have never been there to write her dissent. And there again is one of the problems. And, and it's not just um, uh, myself and a number of other scholars around the country who have uh, criticized this, this proposal that's been put forth by some of these groups, again, that want to do away with um, uh, voting for judges. Uh, most recently, uh, uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has voted this down. Uh, that's a court that has been very political in the past, but even with those political differences, they saw the, the problems that would occur. And, and um, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court uh, has said they're not going to use it. Um, it's just not something that uh, they think that's appropriate. And ultimately what it comes down to is you've got five justices on, on the court. We're all co-equal. I don't have the constitutional ability to take Justice Davis off of a court or Justice McHugh off of a court because the Constitution doesn't give that to me. I'm co-equal to them. And I shouldn't be able to do that. Because again, to do that is to disenfranchise 
uh, people who voted for those justices. Even the chief justice, whoever that happens to be at the, the time, can't do that. No, the, this, the, the chief justice's role is set forth in our Constitution. We don't have associate justices in, in, in our state where you have a chief who has designated role and they're superior to the other four. We are all equivalent and the chief justiceship is more of an administrative title in West Virginia and it's one that circulates or that rotates every year. You mentioned a couple of other things that uh, you at least would like to be better known for than the recusal issue. It's uh, well, certainly what I do, what, what, what I spend most of my time on anymore, uh, except during maybe election seasons. <laughs> And trying to explain what happened in the past. I'm talking with Justice Brent D. Benjamin of the West Virginia Supreme Court. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Well, let's talk about some of those other things you're doing. Uh, drug courts, yes. how's that going? Wonderfully. Uh, we have now just most recently expanded into a juvenile drug court into Kanawha County, which, of course, is the state's largest county. That was something that was long in coming. Uh, of course, Mon County, where this show is taped, uh, we've been fortunate to have an adult and juvenile drug court. The drug courts uh, now cover, from an adult standpoint, I think about 75 to 80 percent of the state's population. We're not there yet with the juvenile drug courts, but we're getting there. Basically, the whole premise of the drug court program is that if you have an addict who commits a crime, and by crime I don't mean a major crime where there's bodily injury or anything, I mean something where maybe they got picked up just for possession or something similar to that. If you've got a person, and that's the key, they're an addict who committed a crime because of their addiction, uh, the court system is going to try to turn that person around, make them into a productive member of society, and through drug courts we've been able to show that for those accepted into the program who finish the program, we've actually been able to turn those people around and in less time than they would have been incarcerated for far less than it would have cost to incarcerate them, the person who comes out is a changed person, a person who's responsible, who has a job, who, has, who pays taxes, et cetera, et cetera. From my perspective, though, the most rewarding thing is when we get to see babies that are born to drug-free moms um, these were mothers who were addicted to any number of substances, but for the entire pregnancy they were drug free because of the program, and now the children that they're delivering are drug free. And in a state where we have as many as one out of four or one out of five babies born with some type of a um, drug in their system, that's something that's, uh, that's very important. We also see people who have now become moms again and dads again because they've re-nurtured those relationships with their children. We see children who are seeing their parents again, but we're also seeing parents who are, have their children back. And one of, the, one of the best things you hear from a grandparent is when they come to you and say, thank you for giving my grandchild back because now they see that child back as they are and they're not addicted anymore. Now, we're not perfect. I wish we could say we were. If we send them to jail, it's going to cost roughly three times more than going through our program. It's, that's a lot of money. And plus, we've got other people to send to jail. Um, and if we send them to jail, about 85% are going to come out and they're going to go right back into an addiction and they're not going to be responsible citizens. And they have better contacts uh, through the people they meet yeah. in jail. If they go through the drug court program, which can take up to two years, and which many will tell you for the first six months they think is probably harder than going to jail, if they can make it through the program and graduate. Uh, our, our statistics d vary from around the state, but basically 15 to 30 percent will go back to drugs, but the rest won't. Now that's compared to 85 percent who will go back to drugs if they go through just the penal system. So you're that's kind a of tremendous turning the numbers exactly. on their head. And uh, in many cases, they are also helping to pay for the costs of the drug court program itself, which already is a third of the price. Now, the, the cost factors become even more important in juvenile drug court. Juvenile drug court, we're focused not just on the individual, but we're also focused on the family, trying to turn families around. In many cases, what we find are other family members now starting to deal with their addictions, because a lot of these kids are growing up in families where they're other people that are, have addictions. And so we're seeing families turn around there. But with children, because of their special needs, it's even more expensive to deal with them through the penal system. If we go through the drug court program, in some cases, it's one-fifth the cost 
So it's a win-win situation. I'm talking with Justice Brent D. Benjamin of the West Virginia Supreme Court. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Another of the topics that you mentioned, uh, and it includes a lot of things that we could probably spend a week talking about, and that is access to justice. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a problem, and not just in West Virginia, but it's all through our uh, legal system in the United States. We've got people who can't afford attorneys who need to go to court. And if you're a non-lawyer, even for lawyers probably to some extent, but for a non-lawyer, the, pro the process of going through a trial, going through some type of a case in the courthouse can be very scary. Uh, it's a very mysterious pro process to most people. Um, it can be very intimidating. And the system is there for the people to use. It's part, it's, you know, the judiciary is one third of, the, of, of government. It's the, the third branch of government. And if the people are paying for it, they ought to be able to use it. And it just strikes me as wrong that so many people have no access even to legal, um, uh, or legal um, expertise when they're going forward with a divorce going forward with an adoption or something like that simply because they don't have the kind of money left over at the end of the month like we used to in the past perhaps. Now certainly for those who are at the bottom end of the economic ladder, those who make twenty six, twenty seven thousand dollars or less for a family of four, we have um, legal aid and I'll get to that in a second. But what we're looking at is that group right above that, 27,000, maybe up to 65 or 70,000. For the, these people, and many of these people are, 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 can be our grandparents, they can be our parents, they can be us in many cases, they can be neighbors, uh, brothers, sisters. If they, at the end of the month, had the need to also pay for an attorney, they just couldn't do it. It's just not there, that money's just not there. So they're stuck with going through a legal system that's scary, that's intimidating, and they're trying to do it on their own. And it shouldn't be that way. What's the cure for that? Well, there's a lot of things. First of all, it's a process of trying to find lawyers that can help them. Now, we just got a curve thrown at us from Congress, where Congress cut a lot of the funding uh, in West Virginia for legal aid. So our access to Justice Commission of the Supreme Court has had to actually pull back a little bit and try to figure out ways we can also help legal aid at the bottom level. Well, legal aid has never been funded to the level it's of the need It's never been where it should be, but now it's even less than it was. I mean, uh, before the cuts, we only had 51 attorneys covering 55 counties in this state. That's, a, that's an amazing number in and of itself. With, after the cuts, are, there's, it's even going to be worse. And so that's one of our problems. We, what we see is there's problems in specific areas. And what we did was recently went around the state and we had hearings where we invited the public to come in. And in fact, the last law work show that we did, uh, Deborah Bogan was on with me, who's, who uh, runs our Access to Justice program in, in Charleston. Yeah, that was the topic of that program. Exactly. Yeah. And what we did was we, first of all, started off by listening. What are the problems out there? And we heard many things which we heard around the state. One is um, not just the intimidation factor, but why can't we just talk to lawyers for specific issues? Why can't we have lawyers represent us for specific issues? For instance, my wife and I are getting divorced. The only issue that we have is child custody. Why do we have to buy a, have a lawyer for the whole thing who's going to charge us $20,000, we can't afford that. Whereas we could afford $2,000 for this. So we need to, we needed the Supreme Court to change the rules a little bit to make it easier for lawyers to be able to do this work. It's called unbundling service. Unbundling. We need to get out and get lawyers, I think, to encourage them to do more pro bono work, which means free work for people who can't afford it. And we need to get creative with how we can better instruct people how to proceed on their own when that's what they want to do. You know, pro bono services is talked about a lot, but in my office, we get four to seven phone calls a day mm -hmm. from people looking for a pro bono or a free lawyer. I don't know how law as an industry can absorb that much free work. I'm not sure that it can. And I'm not, sh and I'm not, and, and when I act, talk about the access to justice program, we're not going to cure the problem. Uh, short of going to a government-funded system, 
we don't have the money to, to do right now. It's something to work on. But it's something to work on. And, every, and so it's just one of those where the more we can help, the better. Justice Brent Benjamin, thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. On the Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us email at thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.